my 45 year old wake up call. I had educated myself even prior past the Carlton Sheeps course. And then the third thing that was happening, this was 2007. And as a banker, I knew that there was going to be a once in a lifetime fire sale on real estate, a la the big short, if you watched that movie. So I knew, I knew it was going to come. I wasn't the smart guy who bet against the collapse of the entire financial system and made a billion dollars, but I was smart enough to say, there's going to be a fire sale. It's now or never. Welcome to the Collecting Keys Real Estate Investing Podcast with your host, Mike DeHaan and Dan Austin. From wins, losses, horror stories, and tactics for optimizing your business, Mike and Dan take a real, uncensored deep dive into the ins and outs of running a full-time real estate investment and wholesaling business. What's going on, guys? On this episode of the Collecting Keys Real Estate Investing Podcast, we have David Vernich, who is the author of Middle Class to Millionaire, and he has cracked the code on how exactly to be a real estate investor without having to sacrifice your soul and all of your time to do so. So, David, mm -hmm. thanks for coming on the show. We appreciate having you. Yeah. Hey, guys. Thanks a lot for having yeah, me. Welcome, it's going to be fun. Yeah. So, first off, I want to just start off talking about like right off the bat, what you sort of told us right before we hopped onto this recording is you kind of like when you first started investing, I feel like you were where so many of our listeners are and where so many people are in general when they sort of start to have an interest in investing where you were 45 working for a bank, you had four kids, you had a, your wife was a stay at home mom. And that was the point where you decided that you wanted to, pursue this. And I feel like that is literally the most difficult place to be when you make that decision. So what's up with that, man? Like, like how did that <laughs> even come together and how are you able to be successful <laughs> in that position? Well, it, uh, success is one of those things where it's nice to have some pressure right. to make you successful, whether you want to be or not. And the pressure I had, and I use the analogy of, a, you know, of four quarters in a football game, instead of, uh, I was at the halftime, so I had to make some halftime adjustments. So I look at a person's working career being 40 years, you know, from age 25, roughly to age 65. So there you got four quarters and I was at 45 there. You're, there I was going into the, into the tunnel running with my coach saying, okay, I, I think I did pretty good. So that first half, but I don't know what the score is. Let me, let me kind of tabulate my score. And so I pulled out my 401k balance and I put up a spreadsheet and I started doing some projections and I'm like, oh crap. If this is where I'm at at halftime, I am in deep, mm -hmm. deep trouble. And uh, in the book, I said to my, I said to this myself, you know, I'm going to have to really cut my standard of living in retirement if I don't do something differently. In fact, I'm going to have to do what Chris Farley did on Saturday Night Live, living in a van <laughs> down by the river, you know, eating government hey, subsidized hey, to, cheese. To be fair now, as a millennial, I feel attacked <laughs> because there are many millennials where that is the new life goal. They you know, you put your Instagram fan. tag on the back of the van, you know, you go and you park in random camping ground parking lots and have your business. That's not a real thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but are you motivational yeah, speakers? Yeah, That's the go. question. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. God, motivational for who? Uh, so, uh, <laughs> so as I was looking at my, uh, looking at the true numbers and, and doing a lot of reading about personal finance and being a banker, I just said, I'm not going to stop doing what I'm doing. So I was saving for retirement diligently, cutting my expenses, doing all the right things. It just wasn't working. And primarily it wasn't working because I was making, you know, $80,000 a year and I had four sons to put through college and my wife wasn't working. So it's just, there wasn't a ton of income after even when you started saving what you could afford to save. So when I, I did that little uh, shock therapy on my numbers and then I said, you know what? The reason I got into banking wasn't to be a banker. It was to run away from my first job out of college that I hated, actually. So I kind of got into banking and then said, well, I'll park myself here for a little while because I can be exposed to all these different businesses because I like to run a business one day. And essentially, after I got to know all these business owners on a one-on-one -on -one basis, each one of them told me the good, the bad, and the ugly about running your own business. And I heard so many bad stories. I basically said, mm, maybe I should just stay and be a banker. But when that 45-year-old uh, reality check hit me, I said, okay, 
putting a gun to my head, if I had to choose somebody to swap places with, who would it be? And across the board, I could only come up with one answer. It was the real estate investors I had lent money to. These guys were actually retiring much earlier, vacationing, enjoying life. And I'm like, that's what I need to do as well. However, there was one glaring problem, and that is I hate everything having to do yeah, with right. real estate. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm glad yeah. that you chose a reasonable person to try and emulate because if I did that same exercise, I'd probably have picked the rock. You know, I don't know if I can necessarily <laughs> right. hit that. That's kind of unrealistic expectations. Yeah. But, um, so my wife is an interior designer now, and every now and then she'll ask me to do something like, would you hammer this painting into the wall for me and, you know, so I can hang this painting? And I'm like, honey, please, I beg you, let me use my favorite tool in the tool belt. It's called a checkbook. Let me just pay someone to do this correctly because I guarantee you I will put six holes in the wall. I'll be cussing like a sailor. It, you have to pay someone more money to come fix what I've destroyed just let them do it, you know? So I don't know anything about handyman work. I don't enjoy any handyman work. I don't want to even learn how to do handyman work. So basically, I don't even want to be around the contractors who know the handywork. <laughs> so I had all these uh, hang-ups about it, plus the fact that it's like I was a banker and uh, 10 years prior to my age 45, I actually was watching the Carlton <laughs> Sheets infomercials. Oh, I, I, I know who it is. Yeah. Remember those? <laughs> I mean, this was running like 24 seven. And I was like, man, I got to get that. That sounds so cool. And when I got them, I was 35 at the time. I got them. Kids were really young at that point. And when I put the first tape in, I said, well, you, you know, you put your first house on mm -hmm. a credit card. And I was like, what? Yeah. And I was a banker. And I was like, what you just yeah. said was sacrilege. And, and, you know, I'm not, that's blasphemy. So I sent it back. I sent that course back. And it took me reading um, Rich Dad, Poor Dad to understand the difference between good dad and bad mm -hmm. dad to start like motivating me to say, okay, let me, I wasn't educated enough when I got that first introduction to yeah. real estate. Fascinating. That's funny. That's, some of those old, um, I guess, like coaches and those sort of things, they're so... Like it's so similar but different than how stuff's done now. Yeah, Carlton Sheets. I've seen those ones. Are like, do you guys ever see da David Vu? He was like <laughs> mm -hmm. a big um, real estate investor no. guy. Have you seen those ones, Dan? It's so yeah. funny. He's like, yeah. he was this like, Asian not. guy, <laughs> super strong accent, and his whole thing was like, I used to be poor. Now look at me, beautiful women. <laughs> we just be, like, on a boat. <laughs> But like, uh, you know, it's, yeah. which is funny because people make fun of that, but that's not any different than what people do on Instagram now, which is it's the exact same yeah. thing. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And, wow. and even talking about buying houses with credit, I actually just did this Instagram video yesterday, kind of ranting because the new current thing I've seen everywhere recently is them people saying, start an LLC, go get a line of credit for your new business right? You can get one up to $50,000. Then just start another LLC and go to a different bank and get another line of credit. And you do that five times and you can have $250,000 to go and start flipping houses. Mm. And it's like, that is just as risky, if not I'm, more than- I'm pretty sure the banker in you, mm -hmm. David, has something to say about that. Maybe <laughs> illegal. Yeah, right. I don't know what's Probably. going on here. <laughs> yeah. So. yeah, it doesn't take much time for a banker to come up with a uh, if you've been in banking for 30 plus years like I have, you realize real quickly, I mean, I can talk to somebody on the phone and probably tell you within three minutes if I can wow. yeah, extend credit to them. You just have you just have a sixth sense about things and you just ask a few <laughs> questions and and the answers are so far yeah, wrong. You're like, we're yeah, done. Exactly. I just need to I just yeah, need to wind yeah. this call yeah, down. Exactly. Right. Real quick. It, it, it is funny. <laughs> I worked for a hard money lender for a short period of time and it was the same thing. Someone would be calling in to get a hard money loan and you knew within the first 30 seconds on the phone, if they were going to be able to get a loan or not. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, but yeah, so nice. So, so you went through Carlton sheets of like, you sent them back, you decided that wasn't for you, oh, yeah. <laughs> went into the <laughs> David Rams zone and like the more, I guess, traditional sort of thinking about things. And where'd you go from there? Yeah. I was listening to Dave yeah. Ramsey at the time, you know, cause he's from this area. Okay. I'm in Nashville. So yep. Dave Ramsey's here. And so I was listening to Dave and yeah, that's evil, blah, blah, blah. And then the rich dad, poor dad kind of, converted me to, wait a second, I'm a banker and nobody's taught me mm -hmm. these basic things like good debt, bad debt. And um, how can you afford something? Not, mm -hmm. I can't afford something. I mean, these were like super big mind shifts for me. So essentially when I did the halftime adjustment at 45, started, kept educating myself about real estate, even though I knew I didn't want to do real estate. And 
all this time, guess what I was doing? I was trying everything but real estate. So I tried starting a business from scratch. I tried buying a business. I tried Amazon physical products, you know, buying things from China and coming over here and putting them on Amazon. And I even tried the dreaded <laughs> multi-level marketing. Um, essentially, what happened on each of those cases is yeah. none of them worked. <laughs> and so I would still yeah. be doing them if they worked. And then it came to, okay, this 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 confluence of several factors. My 45-year-old wake-up call, I had educated myself even pri past the Carlton Sheeps course. And then the third thing that was happening, this was 2007. And as a banker, I knew that there was going to be a once-in-a-lifetime fire sale on real estate, a la mm -hmm. The Big Short, oh, yeah. if you watched that movie. So I knew, I knew it was going to come. I wasn't the smart guy who <laughs> bet against the collapse yeah. of the entire financial system yeah. and made a billion dollars. But I was smart enough to say, there's going to be a fire sale. It's now or never. So what I decided to do, um, there was actually a Rich Dad Education event in Nashville to teach you how to flip houses and do real estate. And it was $20,000, which I wow. didn't have, by the way. Jeez. And so I slapped down my American Express card for 20 Gs. <laughs> And thought, and I was sweating bullets, man. It's just like this better work because this is a lot of money if this doesn't work. And uh, you had a three-day cooling off period where you can get your money back. And while I was driving away day one, I thought to myself, "What am I doing? This company is out of Coral Gables, Florida. They know nothing about Nashville, Tennessee. They flew in here with a really, you know, flashy speaker mm -hmm. who could get everybody to run back of the room with their credit cards." But how is this going to work? And I'm an idiot. I'm a banker. And I literally know people who do this for a living. Let me call them. So I rescinded the 20 grand, grand Stick it to saved them. that money. Yeah. Called, <laughs> That's crazy. Called, 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 called a guy that I had helped get started with real estate. He just got out of the Navy. He was in, the, he was in a submarine um, part of the Navy and got out and was really handy. And a good customer of mine said, can you help this guy out? He doesn't have two nickels to rub together, but he's a hard worker and I'll vouch for him. And so I lent him about $100,000 on a line of credit. And that guy turned into a multimillionaire because of it, because he got in really early. So I said, hey, can, can we go to lunch? I took him to lunch and quickly I said, hey, this is what I want. Because um, I was confident he was going to say yes. I need you to teach me how to do what you do. And he looked at me and stopped for a minute. Then he said, no, Dave, can't do that. And I was like, dumbfounded. What? He said, yeah, I'm a one-man show, and I do everything on, on my own. You need to meet with these people. And I introduced you to these people. These people have been doing real estate for 14 years, and they, they, were, they were in it before I was. And they actually have a class. So I took them out to lunch the next day. And essentially, their deal was you pay us six thousand dollars, still better than twenty, and we'll, you come to our house in Nashville for six Saturdays in a row, and then we're going to do a house together. And that house, you got to have all the money to do it, mm -hmm. and we're not giving you any money. So throw you right into the fire, you know. So I thought that's a better deal than what I had just a few days ago. I'm I'm going to do it. So I wrote a check. I did have six thousand dollars on yeah. a line of credit. So I wrote a check for 6000 off this credit line. Still didn't have much money and went to the house for six Saturdays. Finally did our project house. Uh, we ended up renting it, not selling it. And then they said, OK, Dave, you know how to do this. Go do it. And then I did the timeout. I'm not going to do anything that you showed me what to do. And they were like, what? You spent all this time and all this money. You're not going to do anything? I said, no, because what I was trying to figure out this whole time was where did I fit in the equation of mm -hmm. bringing value? And I broke it down into four steps. You got to be able to find the house, finance the house, fix the house up, and then either flip the house or fool with the renters, okay? I didn't want to do any of them except number two, finance because of the capital that's required. So I said, let me be the guy who brings all the capital to your deals. You get half the deal. You put no money in there, but you do all the work. And they said, well, are you independently wealthy? And I was like, no. Do you know how I got the money for my first house? They said, how? I said, well, I'm a banker, right? So I can look around and say, okay, who are all the bankers that I've known for years? And which one of them 
do I have no banking relationship with whatsoever? And I know that they have at least one hundred thousand uh, dollars loan approval authority. Bingo! Here's the guy. So I went to him and said, "Hey, can you lend me a hundred thousand dollars unsecured? What are you going to do with the money? I'm going to buy a house. Then what are you going to do? I'm either going to flip it or rent it. Well, if you flip it and pay me off, I'm good. If you don't sell it, then I need to put the mortgage on it. And I said, "That's great. That's how I got my first house. I didn't put any of my own money yeah. in because I didn't have any. So I actually did the Carlton Sheets thing, but I did it with a bank." unsecured line of credit versus a credit yeah. card at 18%. Oh, I love that. So I basically, I, I basically pitched them with the idea that, um, no, I'm not independently wealthy. I had no money, but I do know how to get financing. And I do know people, many people that are doctors, dentists, business owners, W2 people that have either money or credit, but don't have the knowledge mm-hmm. or the time to do what you guys do. So if we marry this as a team and we each get a percentage of the deal the, the best thing in the world was the Burr method, which I didn't know was called Burr back then, but basically finance this person's money out and repeat the process. So today, uh, with all the groups that I'm uh, involved in, we have 119. Yeah. That is amazing. Yeah. Scale. That's super amazing. Yeah, I, that David, I'm amazing. like, I'm, I'm very impressed. I'm like listening to this because for a few reasons. The first is... You got some balls. I mean, you just dropped 20 G's on, uh, uh, not that you wouldn't have learned because I do actually think there's a lot of successful people that come out of the rich dad program, but you, you just, you're like the thing you realize that most people don't is you have this critical moment where you're like, the numbers just don't work out. Like I'm, I'm okay now. I'm pretty, you're probably living within your means, but when you got to 65, when you wanted to stop working, your life was just not what you wanted. And I think it's all too easy for us to just not just to keep pushing that out. Just keep pushing that out. But Hey, that's, that's tomorrow's problem. Today's problems are these. And so you, so you recognize that and then you took action, like immediate action. And so your education basically ended up costing you base six grand, right? That's what you paid. And I love that you did it through action too. And those six people were obviously pretty good people to do that. That's a good deal, in my opinion, um, to do that for six grand and then show you how to do it and you got through it. And then the best part is, is you realized you didn't want to do that part of it. So it was worth the six grand, every bit of it. It helped you figure out where you wanted to be in the puzzle. That's amazing. Yeah, it's pretty easy when you can't do very, if you think like you're a yeah. talentless hack like I was. Yeah. <laughs> and the, and the And really the... You know, I knew that before going in there. What I didn't realize was that my unique ability on financing was yeah. a unique ability. I thought everybody mm-hmm. could do what I just did. I thought this is a walk in the park. And as a result, when I, I kind of figured, well, I got to pitch this idea because I'm kind of the glue that holds the whole thing together. The people that are out doing the work don't have time to find investors if they're busy doing the work. And the investors don't have time to find the people doing the work because they're too busy in their jobs and don't even know it exists. And then I'm the guy that says, hey, A plus B and plus C equals X, you know, 10X of what we could do individually. And so after I figured that out, so my original goal when I didn't understand that was I wanted to buy a house at 45, do all the work, own 100% of it, a house at 46, do all the work, own 100% of it. So I was going to buy 10 Mm -hmm. over 10 years. Okay. And then my, my thought process was when I'm 65, because I put 20 year loans on these, my first house will be paid off. Okay. And every year after that, a house will be paid off. So I will have 10 paid for houses, cash flowing about a thousand dollars a month, you know, per house with no debt. So that's $120,000 a year in retirement income. That's what my goal was. When I kind of hit the brakes on that and said, well, this isn't going to work because I can't even hardly do one without vomiting in my mouth. What am I going to do now? Well, then I came up with this plan. And I said, okay, now I'm, I'm going to get a small piece. In this case, we took, I took 25% of each house okay, as an equity partner, 25%. So I need four Mm -hmm. houses to equal one. But guess what? Instead of me doing all the work and hating every minute of it and being bad at it and taking six months to get this thing, do you know how much time it takes for me to do my part? Yeah. Yeah, About 15 minutes. That's a no-brainer. My 15 minutes is like, hey, Dave, we've got a house because I don't have to find them. We need uh, $100,000 to buy it. We need $20,000 to fix it up. Make sure the wire there is there on Tuesday. We're closing with cash. That's That's my job. And so I just reach out there and say, hey, guys, if you're up, you want to do a house? And of course, I've got 
several investors now that are like, when do I get my next one? When do I get my next one? Because their money is not locked in the last one. I've already given it back to them for the most part. Mm -hmm. So they're anxious to increase wow. their passive. That's eerily really close to my initial. When I first bought my first rental property, I was cash flowing almost $1,000 a month. And I was like, this is amazing. I'm just going to do this 10 more times. And I was literally $10,000 a month, 120 20 grand a year. I was like, perfect. Mm -hmm. And it didn't turn out that way. Cause then I realized kind of to your point is actually kind of challenging to do that. Um, for me, it was more market conditions um, that were more challenging to do that. And then I was like, wait, if I leverage other people and leverage other skills, I could do way more than 10 houses. And so that's kind of the journey, the path I diverted. Yours was a little different, but I do have um, one question. So when you're talking about these financers, so you're a banker. So now are you using your banking relationships and finding wealthy people in the community and using them as private money and, and putting together basically funds for other folks? And then those private investors get a piece of the equity, you get a piece of the equity, and then the people doing the work get equity. How does that work? So we are doing it so that every person that's invested with us is doing a house or houses, depending on their financial, and they're actually having a percentage okay. ownership in the house. So they're a full partner owning the house. And essentially, my job is to get them all their investment yeah. dollars back as quickly as possible. Um, not, not these days, it's right. hard to get 100%. Yeah. But in the early days, we were getting them 100% of their money back and just turning the money as right. quickly. So as if they come to the house. table with a hundred thousand dollars, that's what you needed to make this happen. Then you can refinance it. And then their, their um, profit is a, an equity stake in that property. The, yeah. So they will get, once we start doing distributions, they'll mm -hmm. start getting their percentage of the cash flow that's distributed as well as that's great. the profit. That's amazing. Selling. That's like, Correct. and if yes. I misquote this, then please tell me, but you're, it's almost like you're doing miniature syndications per single family home or per property. I shouldn't say single family home. I don't, I don't know. I can assume that, but kind of like mini syndications. And as part of that, you're getting by connecting all the dots, you're getting a piece of that pie. Yes, because at the end, um, and we we've had to, you know, make adjustments for certain individuals who some like, for example, doctors tend not to want to yeah, sign personal guarantees on loans. And so we'll say, well, we can work that out. We don't have to have you on the note, but if you're not on the note, mm -hmm. then you can't be in the title and you don't yeah. get the depreciation. So it's your choice. And then they're like, well, yeah. I do want the depreciation because that's really a, a pretty good um, tax break. Can I put my wife on there uh, as the LLC owner? Yeah. And we say, absolutely. So we can, we can make it work to get them what they need if they understand that they're giving up something, if they, if they can't do something. But generally all of us are on the loans for these mortgages with these banks, because these are not non-recourse deals. But uh, I had a banker friend of mine who actually left one bank and started another. I said, I'm doing these, this real estate investing. Can I bring you a few deals? And he said, sure, we do, we do real estate loans. And I gave him my financial statement, my personal financial statement. And there's this box called contingent liabilities. <laughs> And basically, it's contingent liabilities, for those who don't know, are not direct liabilities in your name. They don't show up in your credit report. These are loans that you guarantee through because it's the borrower is a partnership or an LLC. So he looked at that and said, hey, Dave, you made a mistake on your contingent liabilities. And I'm like, why? Why? What does it show? He goes, it shows like over $8 <laughs> million. Dollars. And I said, no, that's correct. <laughs> And he he's like, how do you sleep at night? And I said, I sleep extremely well. And I said, you know why? I said, you're a banker. You understand this. The first thing the bank's going to do is they're going to foreclose on the property before they try to get your guarantee to be paid off because that's where the asset is. That's the collateral. And I happen to have over $16 million in wow. appraised value securing that eight. So what is my exposure? Right. It's yep. zero. You're definitely covered. It's it's funny, and that's getting out of yeah. that like Dave Ramsey mentality of like all debt is bad yep. too, exactly. Which is, which is challenging to do for some people. I mean, I just pulled up our portfolio here, and I think as of right now, we have what about six million dollars in debt that we personally guarantee across our portfolio. Mm -hmm. And but I mean, like you said, the total portfolio value is like almost ten, right? So like it makes more sense. Like it's it, there's plenty of room there for them to come and like claim things <laughs> if they really needed to. And then right. also because it's all being covered by rent. And I think this is the thing with real estate that a lot of people don't realize is, like at least with my opinion with real estate, is 
you if you're gonna do it, you gotta kind of go big because if you only have like one or two houses and something goes sideways with one of them, it becomes a liability. Mm -hmm. If you have, what'd you say, 110 properties, if you have like 10% of those that aren't paying rent, like it sucks, but it's not the Mm -hmm. end of the world. (laughs) Yeah. You know, that kind of like carries itself and you're in it for the long haul at that point. Um, Plus you have partners, so you never have 100% of the loss, you know, even that case. And so to me, it's like, you know, you see all these uh, commercials, like uh, investment commercials. We do better when you do better, and then you look at it and say, "Well, <laughs> exactly. do you do worse when exactly. I do worse?" I mean, do you actually yeah. do you reach in your back pocket and pay me money for that 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 is lost out of my portfolio? And the answer is, "Well, no, of course not." Then I'm like, "Well, it's always good when you want heads I win, tails tails you lose." But at the real world, is this is an asset, and we all we all have. Our interests are in total alignment if we all gain when the thing works and we all have to pay something. I love that because I I tell tell this to people that are talking about trying to partner or not partner. I'm like, is yeah, you limit your upside, like you cap your upside a little bit. You're splitting it 50-50 or 25% or whatever, but you're also limiting or capping your downside. And and Mm -hmm. if if you not doing this deal is because you're worried about the risk and a partner could reduce that risk for you, if you're not going to do the deal, it's like, just partner up. That's such a better, a better thing to do. And then, right. and, and like you said, you just realized you needed to buy 40 houses and instead you bought 120. <laughs> like, so, yeah, right. so you're good. You, you definitely <laughs> exceeded your goals, but you just, you just had to adjust some of the numbers. And, and that's what I love about you being a banker, David is like, I think you get the numbers. You're like, all these are numbers and we just have to adjust and then manipulate numbers and do these in the right way to reduce risk, to, to increase our growth opportunities and to do something that you can do instead of having to swing a hammer. Um, and, on the same topic before we started recording, which I love about this, uh, the idea of partnerships, as you said, you know, at that point in your life, you really couldn't afford to take that risk or afford to make that mistake, which would have been like, I paid $20,000. Now I'm quitting my job and I'm all in. Like, that's a huge risk for a lot of people. I love kind of to talk about that a little bit too, what you meant by that and like how you, how you got over that. Well, um, the risk was that I would be living in the van down by the river if I didn't do yeah. something. <laughs> and then if I, if, and then the other side of the risk is if I did it and it didn't work, which like I told you before, I always was trying to do things. They just didn't work, but I never bet the farm on any one thing. And so this is way more capital intensive than most other things, but you also have an asset that secures it. So for me, the bottom line is if you don't overspend on the purchase and the renovations, you could probably get out with hardly any of a loss or at least break even if you've done the fat part correctly, just the one thing correctly. And so as a banker, I think I really appreciate risk more than the typical person because I see what happens. I've seen people go off the deep end financially. I've seen bankruptcies. I've seen foreclosures. I've seen what people do that were risky that they thought, well, there's no other way to mitigate the risk, so I'm doing this. And to me, it all came down to, I can't right. screw this up. I really, do, I can't, I just can't. If, if the answer is you're gonna flip a coin and either I'm gonna make it or I will lose everything, then I will choose mm-hmm. not to flip yep. that yeah. coin. Well, and also too, just sort of adding on to, you know, what Dan said too, you did that in a way that, you know, fit your skill level, fit your risk tolerance, Whereas like so many people, they get into that same situation and they give themselves an ultimatum of like, I have to jump off the deep end or this isn't going to happen. And that's where it gets kind of scary. But you, you know, you found your skill set, you knew your connections, you know, like you said, you sort of built the four F's that you had there. You found which one of those fits you and you just sculpted your investing opportunities around that which I think is really, really impressive and, and harder to do than most people think. And I think it's because there's, you know, the collaborative nature of that isn't necessarily easy to figure out with people. Um, and then also too, most people don't necessarily know which of those zones they would be able to fit in themselves, but you, you know, figure that out and you went after it. So, I mean, that's, yeah. that's super awesome. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say the funny thing is, you know, looking back all the ingredients, including the people that I had to, I had to do this with were already mm-hmm. in place. I just yeah. didn't recognize it. I was doing financing and banking for a living. Every day I was shaving in the morning, looking at this dude in the mirror. And I was like, I'm going to work as a banker today. Not thinking, can you take those same skills and do real estate investing with it? 
So all those things were all laid out before me and I had them years before I figured it out. And that to me was the one V8 moment where I wanted to smack myself in the head with a brick and say, what is your problem, you moron? Why did you take so long to figure this out? You had literally every piece of the puzzle was there. You just sat there like, duh, I don't know what to do with this. Exactly. And I think everyone can sort of find that within themselves in the different parts of the real estate process that they really look deep enough, right? Like, I don't know, let's say you have like a service job, you know, like you're a bartender or you work in a Nordstrom's or whatever, and you want to get into this. Maybe you'd be really good at the sales side, right? You're good with people. You have people on a regular basis. So make that the thing that you bring to the table. Become the deal finder. You know, maybe you're an artist, right? Sure, you don't necessarily know anything about how to build houses, how to get financing, but can you build a really strong brand and a marketing process around that to find those opportunities? Mm -hmm. You know, there's there's always different ways that you can sculpt your skill sets around this business, but I think you just sort of have to think outside the box. Um, So... That's awesome. So I, I'd love to pivot over to your book um, and hear some more about that and kind of what your goal is with that book. And, you know, you have a basic rundown about what you talk about in there. Uh, yeah, I, I basically have written this book so that if I had a time machine, I would go back 20 years and hit yeah. myself in the head with this. <laughs> so really what it is, is, you know, I feel like once you have figured out something that's really difficult in life. And you know that there's a lot of people that have the exact same problem. It's incumbent upon you to go throw a rope back to those people and essentially say, you know, you don't have to find, figure this out the hard way. I've already figured it out. Here's what I did. Uh, So that's the primary reason I wrote the book. Um, I've got four grown sons. They're all slightly getting into real estate in various forms and fashions right now. Not as quickly as I'd hoped, But uh, I'd also told all four of my sons, you know, one day, you know, this real estate that I have is going to be passed down to you. It's going to be paid for real estate like an ATM machine spitting out cash. And if you mess this up, I will literally come (laughs) back from the grave, find you and murder you. And that motivates them. I don't know, man. Yeah, they're like, my dad's like, you're going to get an an ATM that's printing money. I think that might be a little bit of a demotivator for me. I'm like. (laughs) <laughs> well that's why i yeah. want them to do it now number one i told them all like like you'll get this when i'm done with it but i'm not yeah. done with it you know my wife and i just took an entire month oh, and went nice. to, to greece because we turned 60 and my plans are to live as long as i can and to enjoy all this and i want them not to be sitting there like buzzards on a branch waiting right. for us to die i want them to say you know you could have this too let's just do yeah. some real estate together you know tag into your dad And one of my sons, so I got all three of them. Three of the sons were really easy to get um, on board because they, I made them play the cash flow game. I I made all four of them play cash flow, but I had one son that was just, he wasn't getting it. And finally he came to the house one day and I said, so tell me what your hang up is. Why can't you do some real estate? And he said, don't have the money. And I said, okay, let me ask you this. Would you read a book from uh, Brandon Turner called how to buy money, how to buy real estate with no money, little or no money down, if I give you the money to buy the book. <laughs> and he said, uh, well, yeah, but I don't like reading books. I like Audible. And he goes, his girlfriend was sitting there and she said, just he'll listen to the book because he has a drive into work. And he goes, yeah, I've got credits on my Audible right now. I'll download it right now because he doesn't read. He'll, he just listens. So essentially, I called him after a while and I said, okay, did you listen to the book? He goes, yeah, that that guy's voice was annoying, <laughs> though. <laughs> And I'm like, okay, yeah, let's get yeah. past the voice and look at the message. Second thing he said was, yeah, that guy says a lot of the same <laughs> things that you do, Dad. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, okay, okay. I said, well, so tell me, after listening to the book, what's keeping you from doing real estate? He goes, I don't have the money. And I was like, did you just <laughs> listen to the book? He goes, yeah. And I said, okay, let me break this down for you. Okay, let's say we do a house together and I can find a house for $140,000 all in. Okay. Who do you know that's uh, your father and a banker who can probably get you an 80% loan? Okay. I got 80%. Well, I don't have the 20%. Who do you know that will that will partner with you in this house 50 50? Uh, I will. Okay. So that's let you down 10%. I still don't have that much money, Dad. I said, Oh, how much do you have? And he said, $2,500. I could put $2,500 in the deal. And I said, Well, who do you know that might lend you the difference at 0% interest? <laughs> and he looked at me and said, you? And I'm yeah, like, ding, 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 right. ding, ding. 
Uh, but if he had said, if he had said he had no money, I'd say, yeah, son, yeah. you need to put up some money. So, you know, I'm not going to do, I'm, if I, you know, then I'm right. doing it all for yeah. you. You haven't done anything, but I wanted him to say, I can afford to put 2,500 then. And he had to put that in first. And then I said, I'm going to sweep all the rents. And it's not, I'm not going to give you half of the rent until that other person's rent mm-hmm. pays off your down payment. After you have 10% in the house, you get that money. And so he's like, wow, that's really cool. And I said, yeah, it's really cool because I showed you the answers to the questions that you had in your mind that you wouldn't ask me, even though I wanted you to talk to me about this. I'm not going to carry you across the finish line, but I definitely want to help you out with this. Was that your uh, youngest son, oldest son? No, that was my number two, my second oldest son. I feel like it's the (laughs) youngest one. Right, yeah. My, 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 my oldest son jumped on with both feet. He has oh, he has great. eight, eight nice. rental houses awesome. with me. Very that cool. is really cool. Awesome. So I guess just to rehash, the book is the book that when you got started before, you know, when you're 45, before you bought all these properties that you have now, everything that you wish you would have known back then. And so people can go and check that out and learn mm-hmm. everything that you've learned without having to pay $20,000 to go to Robert Kiyosaki's three day yeah, course yeah. where they jump around and have you do chance, you know, right, and like yeah. get all hyped up, but don't teach you anything. Else. So. Wow. Well, and the, and let me ask you this. I, I don't think we've asked this, David is so, I mean, the whole premise too is of your story is that you did this while working at W2 job, which is amazing. Do you still work at W2 or have you retired yourself early or where are you at in that stage? So I still work my W-2 job because, and and everyone gives me crap about this. They're like, how much more money do you need? I'm like, it's not about the money. Right. It's about staying busy. Um, I said, I'm never going to retire. I don't golf. I don't hunt. <laughs> I don't fish. I do like to travel, but after about a week, I'm right. ready to go back to work. And it's not that I'm a workaholic at all. I mean, I like to get to work probably around yeah. nine. And yeah, leave yeah, yeah. I'm a banker, <laughs> you know? And so, so I have a really cushy, you know, Monday through Friday. I don't work. I've never been a workaholic. I've never worked overtime. I've never yeah. been stressed, you know, except when my bank gets bought out, which right. happens every few years. But uh, bottom line is I'm going to keep working and I might retire from my mm-hmm. career as a banker at some point, either voluntarily or involuntarily. But it doesn't matter because I've built this runway over 15 years. And so I've more right. than replaced my bank income. And so I figured I've got it. I got the best of both worlds. Everything is just working out so perfectly. And that's what makes me think this can't <laughs> last much longer. It's too good to be true kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. It's too good to be yeah. true. Right. Stop, wow. stop the press. No, I think that's yeah. really valuable, especially for folks out there that are still in their W-2. They're, they've either started or they're trying to start that, you know, A, you know, you don't have to necessarily quit your job and still do big things. Like you, you can, I mean, 120 houses, um, but B, like if you like your job, like there's still opportunity for you to continue to invest in real estate or start investing in real estate. Like it, it's not, it doesn't have to be the the linchpin in your process that has to be removed because I mean, again, 120 properties is pretty, or 119, sorry, I'm rounding up. I'm sure you have a hundred, by the end of this call, you probably own 120. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty great. I actually have, I have, a, I have a hundred number, 120 under there contract. You go. Okay. We'll week. give you so, a yeah, for that one. Uh, but I do think that's, I just, I think that's really cool. As many of the listeners know, I work at W2 jobs still. Um, and I'm kind of at a, I was at a point when we started our business where I couldn't afford to take a mistake. I have two small kids, wife, all that sort of stuff. And so it's like, for me, I have other, other goals in life as well, but um, not taking that risk and then figuring out how to still do things at scale was a big part of my journey. So I can, I can really, you know, vibe with what you're saying, David. Yeah. Yeah. I think it it does resonate with a lot of people and I do want them to listen to this and basically have hope that if this idiot who stares in the mirror every day doesn't understand that he brings value to the value chain in real estate. Everybody has right. something they can bring. They just have to figure out what lane is theirs, what value they bring, and then fill in the fill in the holes with people that are better than them at those those skills. And man, it becomes yeah. so much easier. And it's so easy and it's so fun. And uh, if I hadn't done this, I would have invented a time machine so yeah. I can go back and yeah. kick yeah. myself yeah. in the butt. Yeah. I love well, it. and it's never too late, never too late to start, right? I mean, at 45, yeah. I mean, that's <laughs> not like you're super old at 45, but I mean, still, there's a lot of people out there that they've just succumbed. They're at 45, I guess I'll work till I'm 65, and they're going to put off that number in their head that doesn't exist, the seven-figure, I'll just get $1.2 million to retire. 
in reality, it's probably not going to be that. In reality, that's probably not going to be enough for you. So, you yeah. know, yeah. It's yeah. And basically it comes down to, you know, you can start now or you can start 20 years from now, but you're still going to take the same amount of time to get this right. thing scale the scale up. So you always start with one house. And if you start at one house at 26 mm -hmm. or one house at 66, you're just on that same trail. You just have right. lost all those years. You could Absolutely. have started much earlier. Yeah, but it's also not, you know, again, so it's not too late. I think especially now in the the age of it's not. Instagram and social media, you see this all the time. I think these people that are like in their late 20s and they're super bummed out that they're not rich yet. It's like, <laughs> it's like, like yeah. you got so much time left. And that's <laughs> hard to realize when you're that age. I mean, I'm only 31. But like when I was getting into my 20s, I was approaching 30. I was like, man, I'm not getting old. I'm not worried about it. But now that I'm 31 and we've had some success, I'm like, man, I got tons of time right. to yeah. do stuff, yeah. right? And You do. But it's, it's hard for people to, to realize that sometimes. So awesome, David. Well, I'm going to go into our final questions here as we start to wrap up. Um, first off, crowd favorite question. What is your craziest real estate investing story? And this can be a good story. This can be a bad story. This can be whatever you got. Let's hear your craziest story. Well, the craziest house we ever, I ever bought with one of my partners, um, he called me, he said, Dave, uh, I need, I need some money for this house and I'll partner with you on it. And I said, okay, well, what is it? And he told me, he goes, they, the, unfortunately you probably, I bet you guys haven't had this one. You know, okay. you tell me if you have, okay. The guy that lived in the house was a widower, had no kids, no family, passed away, natural causes, and fell on the kitchen floor and had his body had oh, decomposed. There we go. There we go. <laughs> in the kitchen. Yeah. So mm. in the kitchen, linoleum floor, you could Lamar. actually see the outline yeah. of his body. Yeah, we, had, we, had, we had yeah one like that. It wasn't yeah, on the floor, it was in the bed. <laughs> that they had left there. Oh. Um, so we have like the body <laughs> print and the bed. Um, but so I had, they had it like worn through the, the floor and all that sort of stuff too. Well, you know, the body started to de decompose and that got cleaned up and you can see, you know, I guess, I don't know what yeah. happens when your body decomposes. No. It's probably not a pretty thing, but you know, it was also in the summertime. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if the house still had air conditioning, but essentially it was just, that's kind of a scary thing, but when you're demoing the house, it doesn't really matter right. to you. It's just one of those freaky yeah. things where you're like, that that gets burned into yeah. your memory yeah, when you yeah, see absolutely. that floor. <laughs> um, so in the, was this in Nashville? So in the state of Tennessee, yes. do you have to disclose that somebody died in the house or do you guys basically just like sweep it under the rug? No, you do yeah. not have to disclose it, um, especially if you renovate it. But the, we had major, you know, issues on getting yeah. the title because mm -hmm. you know it was titled in his name, and we had to go find. Uh, we had to, the guy had to fly up out of state to a niece. I think it was a niece that they had found in the title search and doing a name search or whatever. And we were going to try to buy the house from mm -hmm. two people uh, that we found in, in out of state, and one agreed. He goes, "Yeah, I mean, I don't." I don't really know him that well and I wasn't expecting to get anything, but the house was paid for. And uh, the niece basically slammed the door in his face and we sent certified letters like literally what we're trying to do is give you money if yeah. you'll sign this piece of paper. And she's like, I have no interest in this whatsoever and never did. So we couldn't get clear title to the house, which caused the, co the mm -hmm. value of the house to go way down. So we ended up pay buying the other gentleman's portion out and just uh, renovating it and renting so the house this, out. So you just bought the other gentleman's portion. Is that lady still on title? No. No. They've switched over. They just said you will not be able to give someone seller's title until you, uh, what is it called, the quiet, quiet mm -hmm. claim yep. period. It takes so many years before that. If Because we can show they've right. been notified. We sent certified letters. They got returned. And basically with the, that process, we will have title to the house. I think they said three to five years, and then we can do whatever we want with it. But right now we're renting it and we got basically the price of the house got chopped yeah. in half because yeah, of that. Title stuff like that gets weird. That's a big part of what we deal with all the time. We had this lead yeah. that we were trying to get for a while and there was six people on title. Five of them were dead. And the one that was alive was a <laughs> drug addict. And it yeah. was not, oh, wonderful. It was, it was the same very thing. challenging. <laughs> we couldn't get it done because like there was just yes. no way to do it. You know, probate yeah. for five separate people. And then the one surviving party is not able to, you know, 
work coherently with work with you properly. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. no, that, 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 that's interesting though, that you got the quiet title and least you're holding it long term. That makes perfect sense. Um, so cool. Oh yeah. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. The numbers work. <laughs> right. Awesome. All right. So second question, what is the number one piece of advice you would give to someone who is either looking to start their real estate journey or has already started and is looking to take it to the next level? So all I can answer that, the only way I can answer that is the way I did it for myself is my number one piece of advice is obviously to get educated through podcasts and books as much as possible, but that's not the end all be all. That's really to get your mindset correctly that this can be done because so many people believe that it can't be done. And if you believe it can't be done, sure. it can't for you. But the, the truth of the matter is there's lots and lots of people that have done it successfully. And if you don't believe me, go to your local bank, go find a commercial loan officer and say, do you have anybody that's a successful real estate investor in your portfolio? Yeah. And I bet they have several. Yeah. So kind of get that mindset to turn over. The next thing is to take action, which you've, you've addressed before. Taking action is the thing that separates the people that uh, complain about their their you know, how hard things are, or how difficult things are, or how unfair things are. But the people that take action are not looking for excuses. They're looking for ways to make mm -hmm. things work. And if you understand that it can work for you and you'll go out and take action and align yourself with people that have the same goals as you do, you have no choice but to succeed eventually. Yeah, in absolutely. My book. I mean, it's yep. so everything else, repetitions over time, you know, and if you're intentional about it, you will eventually find success. Um, awesome. I love it. Cool. So last question, David, um, where can people find you and follow you if they want to do that? And where can they, most importantly, where can they find your book, uh, middle class to millionaire? It is on Amazon. Uh, so my name is pretty simple from the standpoint that there's nobody else in the entire United States of wow. America <laughs> with my name, David. Yes. But my, I actually checked on, um, so LinkedIn is my preferred method. Everybody that has a W-2 mm -hmm. is probably on LinkedIn. I'm still on LinkedIn. I still have my W-2, but it's David Vernich, spelled V as in Victor, E-R-N as in Nancy, I-C-H. So just hook me up on LinkedIn and um, check out the book. And if it resonates with you, just reach cool. out and say hi. I love it. I love it. Thank you. Right on, guys. Well, thanks so much for listening, everybody. And uh, if you guys enjoyed the show, please go subscribe and leave us a five-star review. And aside from that, anything else from you, Dan, David? Nope. I'm good. Awesome. We're good. Cool. Yeah. Well, thanks great. so much for coming on, thanks David. And thanks for listening, everybody. Appreciate Talk it. to you guys next week. Thanks for listening. Please leave us a review on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. And check us out at collectingkeyspodcast.com for tips and guides on starting your own real estate investment and wholesaling business.